The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur magazines. Today's video, Bold Brushwork with Kathy Odom. Hi everybody, I'm Kathy Odom and I'm so glad that you've joined me in this instructional video. I, just to give you a little bit of who I am, I was raised in West Tennessee in Jackson, went to the University of Tennessee where I was an art major, took everything but painting. I started my painting career 10 years ago. I'm a late bloomer when it comes to this but I have worked really hard at it. I love it and I can't wait to share with you how I've painted this painting. Now that you know me a little bit and um, I've introduced myself, now I'm gonna dive in to what's really important to me as I am in the middle of a painting and starting a painting. Um, I have all my materials where I know where they are. And um, this keeps my mind and my emotions into the uh, painting that um, I am and the subject that I'm about to paint. So um, this is more than ample here. Normally I am a plein air painter and spend a lot of time outside. I have a little camping table that I use and um, but here we've got this gorgeous big table and so everything fits and we're ready I'm ready to show you what's going on. Um, the poche box is, um, is the first thing I set up. I get it set up to where I can see my scene and um, know that I am in a good place to capture, that I don't have to worry about looking around things or um, it's, it's in a good place. More importantly, I get it set up to where I feel good physically, I, I'm, my posture is good and I can um, feel good about where I'm standing, how I'm holding the brush, um, and that's real important to me. Also, um, my palette knife is in place. This box is a Alla Prima Poche box, and it has magnets. It works on magnets, and it's awesome. And um, so anything metal, I can have in a place, and it stays there. And that is really good for me. Now, I'm not the fact that it will stay there the whole time is probably not the truth <laughs> but because we all get wrapped up in what we're doing but I start with it where I can find it. Um, my brushes that I normally start my wash with are actually standing up over here in the panel and um, are in place for me to get started. The paints, I've loaded my box before I get started with ample amount of paint. I don't really want to be searching for the tubes or the color in the middle of my painting. So um, they are pretty much organized in this plastic container. Um, in a situation in the 
studio like I am today. I even have them in order. Um, at home in my studio, I have drawers of paint and they are in order so I can find them in a hurry. But my goal is to fill up my box with ample amount of paints. I'm sure that we have all heard that in all the workshops that we take. It is very important to me. I don't worry about the cost. I don't worry about whether I put up too much. It's, it's, it's going to help me create a painting and that's worth a lot to me. So um, the palette is full. I have um, my paper towels, my Viva paper towels on either side on these wings because that helps me control the viscosity of the paint on the brush. If I need to um, wipe the brush or get it a little drier, that's there in place. This brass container here is a brush holder that connects to my box and I put my dirty field brushes that are um, that are dirty as I'm painting into that box just to keep my space a little cleaner and neater. Um, then also I have my mineral spirits can here and it's connected by this little ring that connects to my box and the ring is called a wine glass holder. <laughs> I have never used it as a wine glass holder, but it fits perfectly on the brush cleaner. And so it's attached to my box and stays pretty stable. So I'm um, very comfortable with that. Um, I hope you can find those. I don't even remember uh, where I had um, purchased one, but it's been a great tool for me. Um, my, also, my scraper is here on the um, box and it is there to help me clean my glass as I'm painting. Um, when I need a clean spot, I like freshness in my paintings and so there are times that I need that dirty mud pile to mix in, but there are times that I need clean. And so I will um, use the scraper and um, get a spot clean for me. So that stays right there where I can grab it. Um, also, um, my cane is here um, and that helps in keeping my hands steady when I'm doing um, detailed work. And it hangs right there, I think. This is a stolen idea from um, Richard Smith, who I have studied and enjoyed. And um, I, the fact that it will hook on my canvas and steady my hand, I think is brilliant. So um, wonderful tool in painting. And when I'm traveling, I have a back scratcher. When I'm flying and can't take the the um, cane along, the back scratcher works just as well um, and is a fun tool to have. It fits in everything. Um, also here on the table, the setup, the first thing I'd show you is my cards, which are reference cards. They're on index cards and I um, will um, be talking more about these later. They um, help me keep on track. It's words or small phrases that keep me into what I'm doing are great reminders of, um, of where I need to go with my painting, what's next. Um, so we'll talk about that later. Um, but they're here, they're part of my materials, they're in my box. Also, um, my brushes, which I have a sufficient amount here, are here and they are pretty much organized with the softer brushes together and the bristle brushes. Also, I have pulled out blender brushes and my favorite brushes that I think um, make some of my work uh, unique is the 279 series by Rosemary. And um, I draw with them with the paint and I also 
lay paint on. It keeps me from getting muddy on my canvas. Also, um, very valuable to me is this lotion, Invisible Care. Um, it, what it does is it, for me, it takes the place of rubber gloves. We all have to think about safety as we're doing this thing that we love to do. Um, this is my way because I really paint with my fingers more than I thought I would. So um, the lotion is just a way for me to put some on. It, it prevents the paint from soaking in a lot. Your hands get cleaner a lot faster. I highly recommend it. Um, now, as far as other tools here on the table, uh, believe it or not, I'll use a square every now and then, and this one has really been used. But um, it is there because oceans don't go uphill. They don't go downhill. They're as straight as they can be. And there's other things that I paint as far as structures, buildings, and they're built plumb. Yes, a barn can be leaning and it can be going in a totally different direction than it should be because of age, but this is a tool that can be really handy to have. It also can be a crutch. So um, when I talk about it, I also say when you're using it to get that line that needs to be pretty straight on your canvas, Take your brush and paint it painterly. Don't just do a strong, hard line with it. Be painterly as you use it. Um, also, some of my canvases are a little bit large for the, um, my box, but I have found that I can put a canvas that fits um, on the box and then put the larger canvas on top of that and use this clamp um, to connect that larger canvas. So I always have this with me because as I'm out in the field, the subject matter tells me what size canvas I'm going to use. So I don't want to be limited. That clamp makes a difference. Um, also, gambling um, is great to give out some of their products so that we can all use them. And um, this, this little bottle going out with me when I'm plein air painting, you never know when that paintbrush cleaner is going to tip over or the wind's going to get it, and there you are stuck with no mineral spirits. So I always make sure I have one of these little containers with me in my bag, and if I use it, I go home and refill it um, just to make sure I've got some with me. Um, here you'll see makeup applicators. Yes, they're not Q-tips, they're mac um, makeup applicators. One end is flat and larger, one end is pointed and it's really got pretty a hard surface on it. And I use this as a drawing tool. Um, it will lift off paint and give me some reflective things going on in trees. And you will see me use this um, as we paint the painting, the hilltopper that we're doing today. I also have these baby wipes with me and they're really great because I'm a messy person and need them. Last but not least, um, my sketchbooks are here and I am one that wants to get a sketch done. If I have found my subject and I want to, I'm really interested in it, if I sketch it and get it on paper, I know the lay of the land. I may not be painting land, but I know the flowers and I know where they are or I know exactly where the objects are and I've learned the subject before I even start painting. That's huge to me and I think it could be great for you too. My setup is huge in being courageous as I paint. 
knowing where things are. I don't have to be distracted. I can also I can just be ready to paint. And I'm already excited. The subject's out there waiting for me and you. And if we know where things are, we can do a better job of it. Okay, let me tell you about one of my favorite tools, and that's these cards that I have just written down words and phrases on that help me get into what I'm about to do. They kind of help me focus and they give me great recall, really, on the stages and the different things that I do while I'm painting. Okay, at the top of the card I've written sketch, which is huge to me. To get that subject down on paper and to draw it so I know basically the lay of the land, even if it's not land, I know where things are. Second is composition. I'm looking for um, where to place the focal point on my painting and my canvas. Next, let's get some paint on the palette and I'm gonna put my wash on my canvas. There is nothing scarier than a white triangle or square in front of you. Let's get a wash on and I wanna do that first. Not that any of these things are in the right order. They're just reminders. So the next thing I have written down is what do I see? And am I really looking at the subject and seeing that that tree, the limbs don't always go straight up in the air. Some of them are broken and go down to the ground. Am I really looking at what I'm about to paint? Hugely, we need to think about shapes here. The large shapes, are they interesting? And it's just something that I need to have in my mind as I'm about to paint. After the wash, I draw and I draw with paint on the subject matter. And I have the word draw on the card just to also let me know that I need all of the darks in before I start adding whites. Also on the card I've written, no whites yet. This is so important to not be adding any of the white paint before I've gotten my dark sin. That's how we come up with all the cloudiness in our paintings. So um, that one's pretty huge. Okay, the next two things I have on the card are values and squinting. If you wanna see the value of what's out in front of you, the dark and the light, squint. Take your eyesight out of, blur your eyesight, squint, and those values will become so clear to you. And it'll be a great, um, that's just a great tool. Already, I'm thinking about color mixtures as I'm looking at the scene. I'm just getting ready to paint, but I'm looking for the right colors or thinking about the mixtures that will make that color as I look. Um, at the scene and the subject matter. I don't want mud, but yet I'm also thinking, can I add or mix a color with the mud that will be a more beautiful, pleasing color? So that's next on the card. Okay, the next word is not a word. It's a phrase, share the love. And this, this is, Probably something that just came to me one day is as I'm adding a color to the painting and it's a great color, I look at the scene and see is there another place that that color would be good. So I share the love. The color is the love. One thing that I'll have on my mind as I'm painting is the temperature of colors. Are they cool or are they warm? It's just a great thing to read this before I start painting and remember all of these different elements. On the back of this card, um, the first word is texture. And I'm always looking for texture in my paints and different ways of doing it, but texture is a big part of my paintings. Next on my card, I have the word scrape. Scraping is one of the greatest tools I've learned in painting. 
how the palette knife or a credit card or a tool that can actually scrape the surface can make something go from really hokey looking to really natural and nice. So that's one of my favorite terms and things to remember to do. Pops of color is another thing that I've written down here, another phrase. Um, it is something that I'm looking for actually for the end of the painting that'll bring interest. But all along and even at the very beginning of a painting, I'm looking where can those pops of color be that'll draw the eye into the focal point. Huge on this card, and I even wrote it in caps, is the word resist. I think sometimes we find a favorite color or we um, are really into one of the objects in the painting and we spend way too much time there or we use too much of that beautiful color um, where we need to resist and remember that it needs to be special sometimes or we need quiet spaces in our painting. One strange word that's on my card, or it could be strange to you or different, is the word peel. And um, I had a light bulb moment in a workshop where the um, description was used. If you could peel all the darks off your canvas, they would connect to all the sides. There would be a beautiful connection with your darks. This made a huge difference in my paintings, so I want to remember the word peel. The phrase on the card, do not chase the light, is there mainly for when I'm plein air painting, and I hope all of you are getting outside to paint. Um, it's been one of the greatest tools in my painting career is to be outside, but is do not chase the light. The, don't like, don't start painting a subject where the light is in certain places or the shadows are in certain places and then try to chase them later when it's an hour later and they're different. Make reference to where the shadows are quickly when you're drawing and getting started in your painting. When I have started a painting and the shadows are in a certain place, I make reference to those. I paint them in with my drawing brush. I get them to where they are because they're gonna change as, as the day and the light changes. So they, I need that reference and I will oftentimes go ahead and get those shadows painted in quickly. The word atmosphere is here on my card, and atmosphere is something I'm looking for. When do the values get lighter in, in distant places? Where um, are the things up close to me darker and um, clearer? Um, I'm looking for atmosphere so that I can tell that story in my painting. Another phrase I have here on the card is, is the sky speaking, meaning that's a way to tell myself, is the sky so beautiful that I don't want to miss what's happening? So I'll paint the sky first because it is going to change. It's going to be different. And real important on the card, which I've written last, um, is focal point. And maybe that's a great place for it to be on the card because I'm about to start drawing or sketching and then painting. And just to reassure myself of where the focal point of the painting is going to be, what is it? And usually I start to draw at that point and then it moves out from there to um, supporting characters in the painting, um, things that I want to be a little bit more loose and painterly after the focal point has been chosen. So give these index cards a try. Um, they have been so helpful for me. You'll get to the point where you can't even read them. They'll have so much paint on them. But take them with you, take you take, or pin them up on your wall in your studio. 
It's a great reference. Now, um, let's get to where, how I choose my subject matter. And um, I usually say what stops me in my tracks as far as subject matter, what speaks to me, what is telling a story that I want to portray on canvas. Okay, y'all, it's the fun part now. It's the part of what are we gonna paint? And um, for me, it's something that stops me in my tracks. Um, it's something that appeals to me so much that I have to paint it. And there's usually story involved. It, it touches something in me from either past or it's just, it may be just beautiful. And I really, really want to paint it. But I'm, I'm finding myself more and more looking for a story to tell. And we're going to show a few images. Um, first, the photograph of, um, that I took when I spotted the subject. And then I'm going to show you what the painting looks like afterwards. One of my favorite quotes is James Gurney, and this came from to me through David Boyd, and I'll, I'll use it forever, but it's, well, wonder what that looks like painted, because sometimes the subject matter may not have the kick or the pop that you want it to, or just the beauty that you want it to, but after you paint it, it could because you're the artist and you get to express what you want to see and what others, what you want others to see. So let's look at the first image. This image is from Cabbage Town in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was on a plein air event and Cabbage Town is where a lot of the Germans lived when they came to Atlanta years ago, and they would say the smell of cabbage was always in the air. But the fun part about it is that they, um, some young people have gone in, some um, folks that love the architecture, and they have um, started turning these homes into really fun places to live. And that caught my eye, and just the whole story of what Cabbage, pa Cabbage Town is. But um, look at this place. I mean, what great subject matter and fun. And it was just so enjoyable to stand in front of this three to four hours and paint it. So we'll go to what I ended up with. And here it is. Um, you want to talk texture. You want to talk pops of color. Um, I love architecture. Just the story of the satellite dish um, with all of Christmas, and this was in the springtime, but um, there was a lot here that spoke to me and really captured the place where I was. This next image um, is a vine that grows um, that's a trumpet vine, and um, it will stop me in my tracks every time. My husband's granddaddy um, took me for a walk one day uh, when he was first meeting me, and he said, I've got something pretty I want to show you. And he walked me down the street, and he called this vine horse rope. And it will stop me every time and when it's a great place to paint it I'll do that but this was an event in Leapers Fork uh, which is a part of the Nashville area south of Nashville in Tennessee and here was this gorgeous vine so um, I was able to paint there on the spot or plein air and did a uh, piece that you could say is a study, and that image is next. This was my study. Um, I found a lot. I found a lot of ways to be an artist with this. Um, it um, let me take parts of what I was seeing and bring them all into the canvas, but try to really. I really tried to 
keep the composition in mind. Where would it be interesting to have the flowers? And um, then the colors um, were great to play with. The next image is of a large painting I did from the smaller one. And um, there was a lot more room to do more painting, of course, and to also um, highlight more the trellis or fence that the vines were growing on. But I had such a great time painting those leaves that Bugs had had a party on and um, with the holes. And um, this painting now resides in Memphis, Tennessee in a collector's home. This image is, um, was part of the Olmstead plein air event. I painted this north of Atlanta. They give us a few days to go and paint anywhere in the state, which is awesome for an artist because we can explore places that probably speak to us more than um, a big city. And um, that's definitely true with me. And this was a, um, actually a museum um, depicting just a lot of the older ways of doing things. And what I saw was the water spigot, for one, there close to the middle of the photo. Also, um, a whale, where at one point they got their water from. And then up on the porch, which is a little harder to see, is an old, old, one of the first uh, clothes washers, electric clothes washers. Well, all of that spelled out to me the story of water. Um, the name of the painting is Chores, which I guess I related to for sure because of um, water being such a main part of a woman's life at the time that this was um, viable and when this woman may have lived and where she would have lived and what she needed to do her chores. So um, this was a really fun um, image to look at. Uh, the painting is um, there and to me speaks the story of just getting the water to your home at that time and um, how important that was. And, it was just great fun for me to be able to capture it in a painting. This image is um, a house in Door County, Wisconsin. And we were driving by on the country road and um, hollyhocks are a favorite of mine. Also, there was a woman sitting out drinking a cup of coffee early morning it just all of a sudden came alive to me. Um, it, the house looks like it's kind of sitting up on a hill a little bit from where the road was and gave it a great um, composition uh, for me and a challenge also with two porches. Where is my focal point going to be? Um, a lot of good things to put into a painting here. A secondary building. Um, and then there were red flowers in the um, window box. That's always an eye catcher for me. Um, just lots of things about this painting. I love to see an old um, antenna hanging off of the house. And even when it's crooked, that appeals to me. And um, so this one had a lot going on. And the exciting part is I'm going to get to paint that for you. Um, in this video. So we'll, um, we'll do that. I'm going to show you the image of the plein air piece that I did. And um, here it is. Um, it became my own. And um, as you can tell, the connections between the house and the little secondary building with the, with the power lines and the clothesline and um, the, the pops of color on the flowers kind of help your eye to travel through. This was a no-brainer. This one stopped me in my tracks immediately. One of the most exciting and, the fun, and fun parts of what I do is the sketch. 
And I would encourage all of us to do sketches before we paint. I can't give it enough value with words. What it does for me is it helps me get a lay of the land. It lets me know where things are. It lets me correct things. If the sketch, if it show, the sketch shows me that it's just not quite right, then I know what to do when I'm about to paint. So I know where to make the changes. So as far as sketching and drawing, so important. Sit in front of your televisions at night with a sketchbook in your lap. Let's sketch. Let's, let's learn how to draw. I don't really know how anybody paints without knowing how to draw. So as far as this sketch, it's not really a value study, although there are some values there. I just love to draw. So I'm going to spend time doing it anyway but I know that it makes me a better painter. So it's get the sketchbooks out, let's do it. Um, find out where that antenna is on the sketch, find or in the scene. Find out where that good looking evergreen tree is gonna land. Connect the building to the secondary building in your sketch. Have fun with it. It's not a perfect drawing. In fact, it's done really fast because I really do want to get to the painting, but I see the importance of this step. Okay, it's time to start painting, and um, you'll notice that the set is a little bit different. We had all of my materials out in front of me when I was talking about just having everything in its right place. But now the materials and everything I need are on my right-hand side which is exactly where I need them. And um, we'll start filling the palette. Um, I use solvent-free gel as my medium, and I will place it in two different places. And then the other is down in the corner. And I like it fresh and clean, so I have two piles of that. Then um, I will put the equal amount of titanium white next to it, and then also up in the ditch of my palette, which I'll explain. I love to work on glass, and in the middle of trying to get the glass cut from my palette, um, there was a reason why they couldn't cut it the full size. There's a piece of wood that was in the way. And as I thought about it, the glass being smaller gave me this perfect area for the paints so they don't run everywhere. If you work on glass, you'll close your box up and paints could end up anywhere. But um, in, with this setup, it's great and it's, it actually um, is something that just thrills me to um, have a setup that I don't have to worry about. Also, here is the Cad Lemon. And notice how much paint I'm putting on my palette. It, um, that's Cad Yellow Pale. It, um, I know that I'm not going to run out in the middle of my painting if I put ample amount of paint out. And I would say this is something I run into a whole lot with students, um, is them not putting enough paint out, worried of the expense or worried of, um, you know, just having leftover paint. The value of having enough paint out where I don't have to think about reloading the palette is so valuable and you're worth every bit of it and the painting is too. Here I am putting in some of my reds. Um, Cad Red Light and um, this order I keep, I have kept actually for 10 years. Um, I love color. I love paint and 
I actually talked myself into not searching the the row of paints in a art store because I really wanted to get to know my palette. And uh, my mentor used this palette. I will admit I've added a few extra colors, but um, it has served me really well. And I know what I'm mixing. I know what to go to in my mixing. I would highly, highly recommend getting a palette and sticking with it for a while. I know that I have stuck with mine for a very long time. I think it was in college I couldn't make up my mind what art form I really wanted to be in. And so when I, 10 years ago, started oil painting, knowing myself, said I am gonna keep things simple. I do have an extensive palette. I know that. I've got lots of colors here. But um, in that I'm keeping these and I know them, I felt like I wouldn't be as scattered um, getting to know my palette. I'm starting to put on my blues. I forgot my transparent red oxide which is really a vital color for me. Most of my drawing uses that. Cobalt blue, a color that I know will cool things down. Ultramarine blue I use as I um, mix with transparent red oxide for my drawing color. And here's a little bit of indigo blue that I added to my palette later. Um, when I want things to go really dark, indigo, indigo blue will do it. I have not added black to my palette. And um, I think because I like the warmness I can get from darks if it's not using the black. Um, it's just something that I have refrained from and it works for me. These last um, few colors, um, two of them I really just don't need that much of. They are more expensive, the uh, cobalt violet. It, but it's just such a great paint for the pop at the end of the painting. So. Um, it, a little dot of that lives here, and, and in this painting it will definitely be used. Violet Gray by Holbein. It's the only Holbein color that I use, but it is a great paint color to have on my palette for shadows and um, also just to mix in with my sky at times when the sky is a little bit more moody. And then Radiant Turquoise by Gamblin, um, just a great, happy, wonderful sky color. Um, also can be used in different pops and other places on the painting. So that is the palette, and we're ready to get to the wash. The wash may be one of my favorite parts of painting. Uh, it's so free and uh, I don't have to worry about anything. If anything, it's just getting rid of this white that is so scary. So um, let's get rid of that. But before I start, the one thing I didn't do when showing you my palette is I didn't mix the um, titanium white and the solvent-free gel together. I'll mix that in a puddle. And the reason I do that is it will flow better. Also, it will add the medium to most all of the paint mixing um, that will occur later when I start to add color to the painting, which also gives it a vibrancy that at times as you're 
paintings are drying, you'll notice them to get very uh, cloudy or the what's happening is some oxidation is going on. And this uh, solvent-free gel will keep things bright and shiny and I think helps encourage me along the way as I paint. Um, I know it has great benefits. Okay, let's start with the wash. I will dip my larger brush and this brush I um, use is um, not a natural uh, bristle. It um, is a manufactured bristle and I don't, it just moves the paint like I want it to during the wash. Uh, I start with Viridian Green and then I mix in a little bit of yellow ochre and then also just a touch the corner of my brush um, with my transparent red oxide and you'll notice I haven't really mixed this completely um, I want to see all the colors present and that to me gives a little bit more of interest um, also just need a little bit more Viridian. This um, makes my um, poche box talk to me a little bit because it's something that you do with a lot of energy, a lot of life, um, because it's so freeing to mess that white square up that I've got in front of me. Um, and also, I'm going to add just a little bit, because of the scene I'm looking at, it had a little bit of a lavender cast in the sky and around um, the house. So I'm going to use a little bit of alizarin and cobalt blue and really water it down with my mineral spirits. And just add a little bit of that in. That, probably the upper part of the um, canvas where I see that color happening in the scene. Next, I'll take my Viva paper towels and um, and just give it a swish. I'm um, just softening what I did, kind of spreading, spreading it out. The wash has so many benefits, um, not just getting rid of the white, but also um, it will um, create a harmony that goes on in the painting that um, that you will actually feel and see as the paint goes on. It's something that's underneath everything and um, causes just a great underpainting look that creates that harmony. And to me, that, that does what I need it to do. And we'll start with our drawing. I'll use my brushes that I talked about earlier in this segment, um, the 279s by Rosemary, Master's Choice, I believe they call it. And it's just a great tool for um, getting the drawing going. Now, I'm also thinking about composition. If I'm out in the out doing plein air, uh, that job is a lot larger than it is here in a studio situation. But um, it also, I'm having to figure out where that composition is, where is the focal point, what's going on. And the house is definitely the focal point. The hollyhocks are blooming all around it and that's really what stopped me in my tracks. So. Um, that is where I want to start. It's pr the main character of my painting. And I will first start 
by just getting important angles of the house put down and it may just be a little dot um, that lets me know where I am or a line and you'll notice as I'm doing this pressure is happening and then I'm lightening up I enjoy drawing so much. It's one of my favorite things. And um, so I want to enjoy this part of the painting. And um, I do so by varying the lines, letting them be um, a little harsher or harder, and then lightening up a little bit. Don't ever be afraid also to just change your drawing um, when you know you need to, which may happen here. <laughs> 